Hello again. This is now episode 12 and in this video I'm going to go through the timeline of uh, this chart that we show quite often. The biblical timeline and how we came up with the dates on this timeline. As you can see, um, we've been studying uh, Mesopotamia with the Sumerian, Akkadian, Ur dynasty, Isin dynasty, Old Babylon. We haven't got much further than that yet. And uh, with Egypt, we've done the Old Kingdom and the Middle Kingdom. And a little bit on the Hittites. We haven't got into the Hittite Empire yet. That That is coming soon. But um, I had an update on this timeline that uh, I want to explain now how we come up with these dates. As I explained in episode one of this channel, of this playlist, um, we're dealing with two different world views in our studies. There's the biblical worldview, which says that there was a creation and a flood, and then God called Abraham out of Ur. Um, some people are Christians, and they don't believe this all to be literally true. They, they maybe believe it's metaphorically true. Um, I'm not going to get into all that. I'm just putting a date on when these events happened according to the Bible. And we're also looking at the history at the time um, that we know, that, that historians have come up with. Now you'll see that uh, there's a, some discrepancy because the historians are generally uh, evolutionists and they believe in evolution so they they do not take the um the uh, any literal interpretation of the bible into account although they they might use the bible as a historical um guideline because there are many many historical references in the bible um the they they see it maybe more as a myth a myth uh, legendary recordings that um, you cannot rely upon for dates. Uh, so, <clears throat> and plus the uh, like, the history of Egypt and Greece um, have been uh, the the topic of historians for centuries. Like uh, the Romans. Um, explored Egypt and the, from a historical perspective. Uh, they, they, the Greek history has always been a part of the culture in the Middle East since Alexander the Great. So those histories of history of Greek, the histories of Greeks and Egypt have always been taught in history class for centuries. Uh, Mesopotamia is relatively new. It's, it's, uh, it's about uh, maybe for the past hundred years it has been a part of archaeology and, and been uh, found to be an older civilization than Greece. Uh, so you know, the, the uh, history that through Darwinism and through uh, the Age of Enlightenment in, in uh, Europe, um, history as seen through the universities has been through an evolutionist viewpoint. So you will find that their uh, their dates when you when you go back to times of Akkadian Sumerian old Egypt 
old kingdom of Egypt and, and back in those times, most of all of the dates are pretty much an estimate. They estimate, well, you know, it, it must have been this date. It must have been... When you get up into uh, the time of Solomon and the time of the uh, first invasions of the Assyrian Empire through the Middle East, uh, the dates are, f are far more um, easier to uh, come by and, and because you can line different cultures up with different uh, separate cultures speaking about the same event, it's easier to come up with a date, an, a historical date, and, and that makes sense and fits in with history. But when you go back before those times, we're estimating because every culture was basically on its own. And there was very few incidents of where the cultures talk about each other. So it gets harder and harder. So when you get back into uh, 2000 BC, don't let anybody tell you, oh, we know the dates. It's, it's all estimate. And um, since Roman times and since when Darwin was seen as a genius who knew everything, since those times, people assumed that what they believed was fact, and they still do, when it's not necessarily a scientific fact because it cannot be proven scientifically. They're estimates. Uh, maybe well-educated estimates, but estimates. So, um, but the Bible, the Bible is quite different. With the Bible, you it, it's very specific. You can come up with the dates. You can absolutely come up with um, not the specific date because it'll say this guy was the son of this guy. This guy lived for this many years and his son lived this many years and his son lived this many years. So you might not know how old the guy was when his son was born. But you can come up with a maximum date. Like it could not have been longer than this because these people's lives are that long. So if you say when he died, he had a son. When he died, he had a son. You can do that. So that's the maximum dates that you could come up with. Or you can estimate, well, it must have been something a bit less than that because he probably didn't have a son he probably had a son before he died. He had a son somewhere in the middle of his life. So, you know, the dates are, there's a maximum or less in the Bible. So when I come up with the flood at 2307 BC, that's pretty much the maximum. It's very close to the maximum. It's probably less than that. So first, uh, before I talk about how the Bible, the biblical dates coincide with the other histories, um, first I'll explain how we came up with these dates. So we have to work our way back, okay, to from times that we know. So <clears throat> there are some great events in Middle Eastern history, well documented, like when Nebuchadnezzar II destroyed Jer Jerusalem in 586 BC. This is a well documented, well attested, agreed upon date uh, by historians and biblical scholars alike. And it's a well documented event in the Bible and in history. It's uh, pretty much agreed. Um, when Tiglath Pilaser the third invaded Israel and took the ten tribes captive, um, the king of Assyria, 
it's pretty well documented and, and well attested in the Bible and historians pretty much agree that that happened in 721 BC. So from that date, we can uh, go back to the time of Solomon because in the kings of Israel, their ages and when their sons were born, um, Solomon's um, Tiglath Pilaser the third. Uh, he invaded during the time of, uh, I think, Solomon's grandson. So it wasn't that far back from Solomon that these well-known events happened. So we can determine the date of Solomon quite simply uh, by working our way back through the king lines in the Bible. And it's pretty much well agreed that Solomon's first year in as a king was 970 BC. So now we have a pretty solid year. Um, the Bible also records dealings between Egyptian kings and Israel kings. So there's also that connection and then there's also the connection to the Assyrian kings. So it's not that difficult to find the date of Solomon. So if we go 9, 970 BC, it's an estimate, but it's very close. It's probably within a decade uh, that Solomon first reigned. So there we have recorded Solomon's fourth year would be 966 BC. So that is an established fact that um, you know, maybe it's within a decade, but we we have established it as 966 BC because of um, calculating it from other established dates, such as the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BC and the uh, invasion of Tiglath-Pilas or the third in 721 BC. Those dates also might be give or take within a decade, but these are the accepted dates. So this is where we are at, okay? Just so you understand that they don't have a calendar. They, it, these are estimates, but when you're in this time of history, you can estimate pretty close, like you can be within a decade. So, <clears throat> Now we know Solomon's fourth year was 966 BC. So if we look at the uh, first Kings chapter six, verse one, and it came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel in the month of Ziph, which is the second month, that he began to build the house of the Lord. So there we are. From the time the children of Israel came out of the land of Egypt until Solomon's fourth year was 480 years. So there we are. If we count back from 966, 480 years, the children of Israel came out of Egypt in 1446 BC. Okay, that's how we get that. And then you'll see the, the 40 years that they wandered in the desert. You can read about that in the book of uh, Numbers. Uh, they wandered in the desert for 40 years. So I'm assuming that the date mentioned in 1 Kings is when they entered the promised land, uh, when they came out of Egypt. Um, so it could be talking about the beginning of the 40 years, but this is where we have problems. And so I'm saying, okay, I'm estimating that I'm making it the longest time it can be. So, um, so it's <coughs> the Exodus was from 1486 to 1446 BC.
okay so now we have another date to deal with uh, in Exodus 12 40 so Exodus chapter 12 verse 40 now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years and it came to pass at the end of the 430 years even the selfsame day it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt so on that day at the end of the 430 years on that day the children of Israel left Egypt okay so that that day the, the end of the 430 years we estimate it is 1486 BC, the, begin, the beginning of the Exodus. So now the question is, when did the 430 years start? Now, at one time I assumed that that would be when Jacob got into Egypt, or maybe when Joseph went into Egypt, because the other... Um, scripture we have to look at is the prophecy that God gave to Abraham about the 400 years. If we look at Genesis chapter 15, uh, starting in verse 7, when uh, this is after God promised Abraham that his, that his, through his seed all the world would be blessed. And then Abraham doubted. He said, how will I know? Because he had, he had no heir. And he said, how will I know that all this will happen? And, and God said to him, starting in verse 7, I am the Lord that brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, where, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? So he didn't believe, he doubted, right? And he said to him, take me a heifer three years old and a she-goat of three years old and a ram three years old and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. So this is a, now, if you are doubting, now I'm gonna have to give you a way that you can have faith. So he's initiating the sacrifice. This is how you, this is going to build your faith that if you do some work to reach God according to your understanding then you will know you will have faith right so he's initiating a sacrifice that Abraham can do so that he will have faith right and he took all these and he divided them in the middle and laid each peace one against another but the birds he divided not and when the birds came down on the carcasses Abraham drove them away so he did all the work of keeping them from the birds and when the sun was going down a deep sleep fell upon Abraham and lo a horror of great darkness fell upon him and he said unto Abraham, Know of a surety that your seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And that nation whom they shall serve I will judge, and afterward shall they come out with a great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come here again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So there, there's the prophecy of the 400 years in Egypt, right, that God gave to Abraham. So um, when does the 430 years begin? Uh, is it when Jacob went into Egypt um, with to see Joseph? Well, we have uh, some references we can look at to see if it was 400 years from the time of Jacob entering Egypt 
up until Moses talking to the Pharaoh was that 400 years. Well, let's take a look here at the genealogy of the Levites. Because we know Moses was a Levite. He was the son of Levi, right? Okay, so if we look at Exodus chapter 6, we have a little genealogy here of the Levites. In verse in Exodus verse chapter 6 verse 16 we read, and these are the names of the sons of Levi according to their generations, Gershon, Koath, and Merari. And these are the years of the life of Levi. And the years of the life of Levi were 137 years. So there's uh, the three sons of Levi, Gershon, Koath, and Merun, right? And Levi lived 137 years. If we look at Exodus 6, 18, and the sons of Koath were Amram, Izar, Hebron, and Uziel. And the years of the life of Koath were 133 years. So there we see the sons of Koath, Amram, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And then in uh, Exodus chapter 6, verse 20, we read, And Amram took him, Jochebed, his father's sister, to wife, and she bare Aaron and Moses. And the years of the life of Amram were 137 years. So Amram was the father of Aaron and Moses. So if we add up from Koath to Amram to Aaron, okay, it's uh, 133 plus 137. Now we know Moses... In Exodus chapter 7, verse 7, And Moses was 80 years old, and Aaron 83 years old, when they spoke to Pharaoh. That's when he turned his staff into a serpent and said, Let my people go. So from that time, that's the end of the 430 years, Moses was 80 years old. Okay? Now, Koath, was the son of Levi, and Levi was the son of Jacob. So Levi, he went into Egypt with Jacob, but how long was it from when Levi went into Egypt with Jacob when Koath was born? We can look at that, and that we will find. Genesis chapter 46, verse 8 to 11. And these are the names of the children of Israel which came into Egypt, Jacob and his sons, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and the sons of Reuben, Hanok and Phalu and Hezron and Camri, and the sons of Simeon, Jemuel, Jamin, Ohad, Jachin, and Johar, and Saul, and the son of the son of a Canaanitish woman. And the sons of Levi, Gershon, Koath, and Merari. And the sons of Judah. And it goes on through all the sons. Until we see at in verse 26. All the souls that came with Jacob into Egypt. With, which came out of his loins. Besides Jacob's sons' wives. All the souls were three score and six. So all the seventy people who were the children of Jacob that came into Egypt and we see in this chapter named among the 70 people is Levi and his three sons came into Egypt with Jacob so Koath came into Egypt with Jacob so if we look at the life of Koath 133 years and the entire life of Amram, 137 years. And then Moses, 
for Aaron was three years older than Moses. Aaron was 83 when he uh, stood before Pharaoh with his rod. That's a total of 353 years from when Jacob went into Egypt and when Moses went before Pharaoh. Now we know that um, Moses, from the time Moses challenged Pharaoh until the children actually walked out of Egypt was less than a year. So it's only 350 years maximum from the time that Jacob entered Egypt until the time the children of Israel went out of Egypt. And if you think, okay, that's if each, if Koath had Amram when he died, and if Amram had Aaron when he died, that's how it's calculated. And we know that's not true because, first of all, when Abraham had Isaac, Abraham and Sarah were a hundred years old. And that was a miracle. That was considered a miracle. Abraham and Sarah laughed. They said, how can we have a baby when we're a hundred years old? And God did it by a promise and it was a miracle. Um, so even we know in those days, even at a hundred years old, it was considered a miracle to be able to reproduce. So even if they all had their sons when they were a hundred years old, that would only be 283 years. And we know it would be even less than that. It was probably between 200 and 250 years from the time Jacob went into Egypt until the children of Israel left Egypt. So how can it only be 250 years when God said to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, verse 13, Know of a surety your seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them, and they shall afflict, afflict them 400 years. So when did the 430 years begin? It did not begin when Jacob entered into Egypt. It began sometime before that. Now, fortunately, in the New Testament, we have another clue from the Apostle Paul. If we look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 16 to 19. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made that all the world shall be blessed through him, right? Through his seed. He says not and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, so that's the promise, the law, which was brought through Moses, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, that it should make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. So Paul here is saying from the time that God gave Abraham the promise, to the time of Moses giving the law is 430 years. So the time God gave Abraham the promise is in Genesis chapter 15. And then Abraham doubted. And then Abraham had the sacrifice of the cows. And he was given this great vision of darkness and the prophecy of the 400 years. So that, that is the beginning of the 430 years, the time he was given the promise and the prophecy when he doubted. So the, 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 he said, the, Paul says the law was brought in because of sin as a school teacher. 
Um, so that is uh, because of Abraham's doubt, the law was brought in. And, and it's not only Abraham's doubt, but it's man's doubt, man's tendency to doubt, which was reflected through Abraham. The father of faith doubted. He got the law and the sacrifices to help his doubt. Okay, so if we say, okay, now this happened um, right after that is when Abraham and Sarah decided to fulfill God's promise on their own and they uh, gave Hagar gave birth to Ishmael was the next event. So if we go from the birth of Ishmael um, that would give us the beginning of the 430 years before the exodus from Egypt. Now, first we have to say, okay, the, the relationship between Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We have to look at um, when were they, when was Abraham born, Isaac born, and Jacob born in relationship to each other. So, I'll list off the verses here, and we will see in Genesis chapter 21, verse 5, this tells us that Isaac was born when Abraham was a hundred years old. In Genesis chapter 25, verse 7, Abraham lived for 175 years. Um, in Genesis chapter 25, verse 25, we see that Jacob and Izu were born when Isaac was 60 years old. In Genesis chapter 35, verse 28, we see that Isaac lived for 180 years. In Genesis chapter 47 verse 28 we see that Jacob lived for 147 years so this gives us uh, uh, the dates that we need for Abraham Isaac and Jacob in relation to each other you see the blue bars are the life the life of Abraham the life of Isaac and the life of ja Jacob so how do we peg these dates? Well, if we count back 430 years from the time of the Exodus, it would give us a date of 1,916 years. So 1916 BC is the beginning of the 430 years. So we know Ishmael was born one year before Isaac was born. And we know Isaac was born when Abraham was 100 years old. So that gives us a date of Isaac's birth at 1915 BC. So when we know Isaac's birth was in 1915 BC, from that birth, we can calculate all the other dates of when Isaac was born and died, when Abraham was born and died, and when Jacob was born and died. So now we can see on our chart here of Abraham's, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's lives on, and the date of their births and deaths. So now if we want to go back further than that, if we look at um, Genesis chapter 11, beginning in verse 10, we see the descendants of Shem. Now, Shem was one of the sons of Noah, right? And um, he gave birth eventually to Abraham. He was a forefather of Abraham. So we see that the dates of the sons and daughters, as Shem lived after he begat Arphax, 
Five hundred years he begat sons and daughters, and Arphaxad lived five hundred and thirty years and begat Salal. Arphaxad lived after he begat Salal four hundred years and begat sons and daughters. So it goes through what age the father was when the son was born and how long each one lived. So from there, you can calculate from Noah all the way down to Abraham, the time, the dates of uh, the specific time, uh, how many years. And so that brings us to a date of the flood at 2307 BC. So you can see we're pretty close, like we're within a few decades of the date of the flood. Uh, inaccuracy according to the Bible and you can also go back to the creation if you look at Genesis chapter 5 okay the descendants of Adam and it goes from Adam all the way down all the way to Noah and you can go by um, by how many years it was between each father and son, all the way from Noah back to Adam. And the, if you calculate it all out, you will come up with a date for the creation of the world, 3360, of 3363 BC. So, you know, here we have a big disagreement between scientists and the Bible. The Bible says the world was created in 3363 BC and then there was a flood in 2307 BC and then uh, the history carries on from there. So if we don't have to solve these differences it's you either believe it or you don't believe it um, I will say this to Christians, Jesus Christ believed it. He, Jesus Christ believed in the book of Genesis and in Exodus and, and the whole Torah. He um, never said anything about, well, it's just a metaphor. Uh, he spoke of Adam. He spoke of Cain and Abel. He spoke of Noah. So Jesus is our standard of what we should and should not believe and, and what is right and what is wrong. So Jesus completely believed in the book of Genesis. So you, you can't um, not believe it and still agree with Jesus. So that's all I can say about it, right? So now when I do my history of secular history, I, I speak of it as, as the scientists do. But if we take a look at it now, we'll take a critical look at these, all of these histories together. The flood, Mesopotamian history, Egyptian history. They're all, um, not a lot um, of difference in the years. We can see the Sumerian history is said to begin around 2334. So Sumerian history is estimated to have begun right after the flood, basically. And, and the history of uh, man turning from uh, hunter-gatherer into farmer is coincides with the scientific history, which is at the beginning of Sumerian history, when the hunter-gatherers found the grain and decided to start farming, and they started to make cities, okay? And it's the same in the, in the book of Genesis, right? Where, uh, Genesis chapter 8, verse 22. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night, shall not cease. So uh, now he's talking about the seasons, right? And uh, um, he put the fear of man into the animals 
and he said the earth will no longer be cursed, right? In uh, in verse 21 of chapter 8, he's, he says, Neither will I again smite any more every living thing, and I will not curse the ground, ground any more for man's sake, right? Well, remember to Adam, he said, Cursed is the ground for your sake. Um, it will not produce for you. It will only produce thorns and thistles for you. So he's like, he's like, you cannot farm. So Adam was a hunter-gatherer. He had to uh, forage for his food. But after Noah, God said, I will not curse the ground anymore. So now he becomes a farmer, right? And their seed time and harvest is, is ordained. So... Um, there's there's a correlation there between scientific uh, the scientific community in the Bible with the flood of Noah and the rise of the Sumerian civilization. Okay, now the Egyptian history kind of stretches further back because it's a much older history, um, and even modern scientists can't really disagree with it without a lot of controversy. And, and that old uh, dates have been around since, you know, the 12th century or, or Romans studied it. Uh, the, the, the Age of Enlightenment, Egyptian history was like the, some of the first history that was ever really studied by Europeans. So they came up with those much older dates. Uh, they didn't understand the dating of the Bible. Um, but when we see Mesopotamian history is much newer because of the newer archaeology and the dates coincide much more with the Bible. So, you know, it's just a, a point of thought. And, and another uh, thought that I had about this is uh, Nimrod. If you think about Nimrod, In Nimrod, we can read uh, about him in Genesis chapter 10, verse 8 and 9. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore, it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Uruk, and Akkad, and Kalna, in the land of Shinar. Okay, it's the land of Sumer is what it is. And these are the cities. Akkad, we know Akkad was founded, it, it's the, the, it was the capital city of the Akkadian Empire, founded by Sargon, Sargon the Great. So, how does that reconcile with all of Sumerian history and uh, hundreds of years of uh, Akkadian history and Sumerian history talking about this man Nimrod. Well, I think of it this way. If we look at uh, Judges chapter 1, now this is when Judges chapter 1 is when... Uh, Joshua becomes the leader, and um, they've, they've gone into the Promised Land. The twelve tribes of Israel have gone into the Promised Land, and Joshua is now the leader. The twelve children of Israel are long dead, and this is their children now, the twelve tribes of Israel. And jo Judges chapter 1 says, now after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall go up for us against the Canaanites first to fight against them? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I, delivered, I have delivered the land into his hand. So the tribe of Judah shall go up. And Judah 
said to Simeon, his brother, Come up with me into my lot, that we may fight against the Canaanites. And I likewise will go with you into your lot. So Simeon went with him. So now how does this happen when Judah and Simeon have been dead for hundreds of years? Uh, they've been dead since uh, just after the death of Jacob. They were dead before Moses was born. So how is it that Judah and Simeon are talking? Well, what it's saying really is the tribe of Judah said to the tribe of Simeon, his brother, come up with me and fight with me. So this is a, a, a an alliance between these two tribes, right? But it's talking as if it's Judah and Simeon talking, the actual men. So if we go back to Nimrod, and we look at Nimrod in this same way, and say, well, it's not Nimrod himself, but it's his children carried on this legacy and Nimrod's legacy built these cities, you see? So if we look at, okay, um, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalma. And out of that land went forth Asur, and builded Nineveh, right? So Asir was the beginning of Assyria, so what he's saying is the beginning of Nimrod's kingdom was Babel in the land of Sumer and he built or his legacy his children built the all these other cities even leading up to Akkad. So the so he, I think basically he's saying Nimrod was the um patriarch of the Akkadians. So, because if we look at Sumerian and Akkadian history, the Sumerians were the original um, people, the, the, the indigenous people of the land of Sumer. And then uh, the Akkadians moved in and they were called Amaru or we called them, we, we assume they're Amorite, right? Maybe the um, Sumerians assumed that they were Amorites. But the Bible saying they were actually um, descendants of Nimrod, who was a Cushite. Cush was the son of Ham, and Nimrod was the son of Cush which would be from more from Arabia than from Canaan. So Nimrod was actually probably Arabian from that area, and he came into Sumer and built these cities, and his children built these cities. So what we're seeing in the story of Nimrod is basically a, uh, a an overview of the of of the events he's explaining to them that Nimrod is the one who came in as a foreigner and built these cities pushing the indigenous people out the the Assyrians who went north and built Nineveh and and those other cities so the history does actually reflect this and if we look at the Tower of Babel, when all the people were together and they all said, let's build us a tower, well, in every city they did this. They built the tower to God, and let's make the God of the city at the top of the tower, and we'll have the priests talk to God. So this is like the Tower of Babel. It's, it's, it's like a almost metaphorical but also based on a true story. Is, is He's talking about where the idea comes from, and he's just summarizing, you know, a few hundred years of history in this story, and saying, he's giving 
Because we have to remember the book of Genesis, God is giving Moses the history of Israel. And he gave very detailed history of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and quite a detailed history of Noah and um, certain parts of it. And then some parts of it are more of a general, you know, few hundred years in a story, like the story of Nimrod. Um, and he built these cities. Well, it's actually generations of his sons built these cities. And then them worshiping the tower is, is like building the tower at Ur and in every other city, but Ur was the biggest one. And, and, and it's just the idea. And then the breaking up of the languages, well, that's the Akkadians coming in to Sumer bringing a different language and and other languages coming in and then cuneiform writing uh, being adapted and changed into Akkadian writing and the legends becoming mixed up and confused, right? This is the confusion of Babylon. So, so the legends are being mixed together and the writings are being ad adapted and changed and later it read it, it led into papyrus scripts um so this is just god is basically summarizing all of that in the story of the tower of babel he's he's telling them this is because he's talking to moses he's talking to someone who lived in 1486 bc I mean, he's not going to tell this guy about the, you know, stuff you'll see with the Hubble telescope. He's, he's giving them an understanding of their history, which is actually quite accurate if you really look at it. But he's giving it in a very summarized form in something they can relate to. So, but it's also very true and accurate and based upon real people like Nimrod and Noah. Um, but then he's summarizing hundreds of years in a couple of these stories leading up to Abraham because that's where it becomes the, po the, the important point that God wants to get across to them comes through in the faith of Abraham. So that's where he really narrows his focus and starts to explain in great detail the lives of their forefathers but he's just showing leading up to Abraham he's doing these hundreds of years in these stories so that's the way I see it um, but they are also based upon real people like Nimrod was a real person Noah was a real person uh, Nim but Nimrod building these cities is his legacy building those cities and his legacy building that tower right okay well that's the way i look at it and uh you know this is our biblical history as compared to the uh, scientific history of mesopotamia and egypt and the middle east so we're going to move forward from there I hope you got a lot out of this video, and uh, it's just something that we deal with, and we accept and move on, right? Thank you very much.